And so, noticing that the priority is on Christ and not the spirit and not the witness, I think there's also something that's, that's pretty profound here. And that is the movement that we see of people and of God. It should remind us of something in the Old Testament. Right here you have, they're all, they're all gathered in one spot. And they've been drawn in. If, if you consider all the different places, there's a, a slide that kind of portrays this, this range of people. Right? When you consider all of the range of which they've drawn in, if we look at where they've all come from that are on that day, even as far as Rome, and they've all come in and they've, they've gathered in one spot, like centripetal force, that's just gravitationally bringing them in. And God in his foreknowledge and his sovereignty knew that as he had designed these holy days that would draw people in, that these would gather into one spot and in that moment, he would come down in a miraculous way fulfilling the prophecies that he had told them about and he would, he would impact them in such a way that he would transform them by the presence of his spirit and they would then become his witnesses. And this is what defines them from this time until Christ's return. That all who live in the last days, including us, are defined as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Disciples, followers, apprentices of the master, of the king. And notice they come in, they receive the spirit, and then they go back out. Like a centrifuge. Sending them back out again. Drawing them in and then poof which is, that's the other slide that we have on. That's the backdrop of this whole series. The idea that in one location, they're all sent then out. And the cool thing is, the Tower of Babel, we remember that they were all gathered in one place, all speaking one language, and then God came down. And because of the evil that was in their heart and he knew the wickedness that they could accomplish if they remained united in one language, he confused their language, created diversity that day, created, uh, there was the table of 70 nations creating different languages, confusing them and then spreading them out. And now you have God drawing them back together into one spot, giving them one tongue, one language, the gospel. Giving them one message, the gospel and then sending them back out again to do what they were always meant to do, proclaim and represent the image of God in the world. And what's fascinating is you can see that it's happening, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But you can also look at this list of the, where people are from, and you could go look at 1 Peter, right? Go look at 1 Peter, and, and in the 1 Peter chapter 1, you're gonna see a list of the people that Peter is writing to, many of whom are listed there that day. People that Peter has not gone to visit, but many years later will write a letter to them, knowing them, knowing that they're dispersed, that they're out there. These are people that were likely present at the day of Pentecost when he preached his sermon, those 3,000 that gave their lives to Christ and then were there with fellowship, with the believers, and then eventually went back home, taking with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because now... Their identity is they are witnesses of the risen one. And so they take the gospel with them. And that is what we are called to do. It's not left up to the professionals. Because there are neighborhoods, there are workplaces, there are households, there are families that you are a part of that I will never, ever encounter. You are the witness of Jesus Christ in that space. And one of the things that we see here is some encouragement about being a witness, that it's not up to us. It's God who does. See, notice that the Holy Spirit, in this case, opens the door for witnessing. Notice that right away, it is when the Spirit arrives, there's the sound of wind, there's the visual of the fire, and they begin to witness. They're empowered, but they, the door is opened. They're wondering, what is this? but it's God who initiated, God who started it. The Holy Spirit opened the door. Now they had to, out of faithfulness and obedience, step into the door. But then the Spirit empowers, gives them inspiration, 
and insight, understanding what's going on, discerning in the hearts of the people, understanding their perplexity, and then inspiring Peter to clearly articulate from the prophet Joel, from David, inspiring and empowering him to speak the truths of God from the scriptures. And then notice it is the Spirit who convicts of sin. The Spirit is the one that cuts them to the heart as they hear this truth. We don't, we don't have to generate opportunities. As we walk faithfully with Christ and we pray, Lord, open some doors today. He will. We faithfully walk into those. and We don't have to go, okay, now I've got to come up with something clever to say. He empowers. He gives us insight, discernment, maybe what's going on underneath the surface, maybe a question to ask, maybe a truth to share, maybe a part of our story. But he empowers us to be a witness to the risen one, the one that we have encountered, Jesus Christ. And then he is the one that convicts of sin. We don't have to sit there and try to convict them that, of sin. We're not the Holy Spirit. We're just faithful witnesses. That's all we do, is we follow and walk into the opportunities he has created, empowered by him, and then letting the Holy Spirit do the work of conviction. See, there's going to be all kinds of activity that the Spirit does. And I think as we go through this book and we see the different ways in which the Spirit moves, we can have greater confidence as witnesses of Christ. See, in one sense, he, he brings regeneration. He is the one that takes hearts of stone and turns them to hearts of flesh. He's the one that, that draws them and transforms. He's the one that inspires and illuminates. He inspires Peter's speech here, but he also illuminates their understanding of what he is saying. The Spirit sanctifies. As we walk in obedience, he conforms us, as Paul says in Romans 8, conforming us to the image of Christ. And he empowers. And we're going to see that there are ways in which the Spirit of God empowers believers in particular places and in particular ways and particular people. But we're also told that we are given spiritual gifts to use for the growth of the body, the maturity of the body, and for unity as we all seek maturity in Christ. And we're going to see fruit of his spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are going to be evident in the life of our community. And a watching world will go, what's going on there? And our existence as a church family will be in and of itself an open door that the Spirit creates for us to talk about our life in Christ and our life together. And so we are to be faithful witnesses, ready and willing, seeing open doors, trusting in his empowerment and watching him convict of sin and for us to follow up with the love of Christ and the forgiveness that comes, encouraging them to walk by repentance faith and obedience in Christ. So let us be a church of faithful witnesses. Amen?